lectures in pre prehistory. Sites that are 12,000 years of age. And for example, 
One of them is uh, Poinsett Bridge up in Greenville County. Um, Poinsett Bridge was uh, built as part of state road system from Charleston to Asheville in 1820, named for Joel Poinsett, and built by, um, and, excuse me, designed by uh, Robert Mills and built by a man named Abram Blandy. And so part of what put this slide up here because of the slide in the, or the picture in the middle is uh, watercolor uh, of the bridge we think may have been done by Robert Mills. Um, Joel Poinsett's over here on the left, of course. Uh, he brought back a Poinsettia out of, uh, out of Mexico. So part of what we're supposed to do as is a program is to tell stories about this problem. One of the things that we have to do is manage it. And while um, Picture on the left, that would have been a great artwork project for something in the middle of Greenville County. It wasn't nice to have that on our 18, 20 year old stone bridge. So we have to manage these things for people to who often do and go and do things at our properties that we would much prefer them to have to do, like the, the wedding picture or the baby picture on the right. Um, so while we manage properties, we also do research on some problems. Um, this is a image, I'm sorry, it's kind of faded out, but it's an image of two maps that show you the level of work that we're out there doing when, in the way in which we are doing it. Uh, it's called a shovel test survey. So if we want to survey this property out here in front of us, we start with hand screen, small shovels, digging holes uh, every 100 meters across the thing, and all that data goes into our iPhones, which goes into the cloud, which then goes into my computer, and so I can watch my people in the field working. I'm like, uh, Robert, you haven't done a shovel test in an hour. What are you doing? <laughs> so, um, and this relates, this slide relates in a research way, way to what a fix to get into in terms of the middle and late arcade and how we know what we know. So, this is a site over in uh, near Elgin. It's called White Pond. And it's a natural pond. And it's got peat in the bottom of it. And we were assisting a colleague, Krista Moore, with taking peat cores. So Chris is up on the, on the, on the boat. Um, and I'm in the water uh, doing the work. So that's the difference between a PhD and an MA. I'm in the water. But what we were able to, what, and, and I, I pick at Chris a lot. But uh, Chris is new to us, and what he did in that thing in the center is the core. So we took a four inch aluminum pipe and drove it into the muck, put a cap on it so you had a suction, and then pulled it back out. Well, that pulled out two meters, over six feet of, of, of peak. And what Chris did, he went in and he uh, cut that aluminum pipe in half, and then he went through and took little samples from top to bottom. And what he was looking for was elephant poop. Because there's a bacteria in elephant's gut that when they go to the bathroom in the water, like cows like to do, you can go back and find that bacteria. You take their little samples and send them off to laboratories, I think in California, and where you lose, where that bacteria goes away and doesn't exist anymore, that's where the uh, Pleistocene metafauna die off occurred. I mean, you radiocarbon that 12,800 years. So I gave it, I, I had a little elephant doing his thing for our DNR board, and I thought that was great fun to say, hey, we're looking for elephant food. Um, so the Holocene. Holocene is what we're talking about in the middle of the late archaic. And in this peak core, the, the red arrows are pointing to that point in time. Pleistocene is down here at the bottom. How deep is that? About eight feet. There's the Pleistocene, there's the extinction event. And then here's, Chris, this is Chris's animation of what, using um, artist uh, renditions of native peoples uh, and where they would fit in that, in that peak hole. Um, so that's one of the ways we start to reconstruct events in the past, is looking at the environmental record. And we can only get at that environmental record through things like peak cores, where you can get pollen and bacteria and um, tiny invertebrates and figure out what are, you know, you've got a lot of grass pollen. Well, 
got a grassland, you got a lot of pine tree pollen, you got a pine tree forest. So, and you carbonate that, we can figure out where, um, where in time those different things are, and then what do they uh, tell us about the environment? Follow me? All right. If you come to Columbia, um, invite you to come to our archaeological research facility, Parker Annex Archaeological Center. It's on the Bull Street campus. It's a refurbished 1910 in San Asylum. It's where our offices are, our curation, our laboratory, meeting space. And I get to tell people I finally made it to Bull Street. <laughs> my parents, I wish my dad was still here, so I could tell you that about that. But, uh, and this is a, the shell ring site that I mentioned that a couple of you asked me earlier. Um, one of our projects that we are, are doing is kind of research projects, really a re uh, emergency recover project. Uh, get as much as we can before it's gone, and I'll talk more about that towards the end of this presentation. Um, but it's on Edisto Island, and it's about uh, shell rings that we discovered here about five years ago, uh, one of which we've already lost. But at this point, I'm going to stop with all of that. That's who we are and what we do in a real nutshell. Um, and we'll talk about middle and late archaic. Um, I hadn't really studied this topic in a very long time, so it was actually really nice to have me and asked me to come and do this. It forced me to sit down and, and look at this and look at what we know about middle and late archaic people, indigenous people, Native American people in South Carolina and, um, and abroad. And you really, if you just look at South Carolina, you're not going to get a complete picture. You really got to look out on um, the great book of archaic mid-continent uh, in North America. And it, it's the, really the, the southeast over to uh, the Mississippi. And through looking at the articles and the research that's been done, you get a much greater detailed picture of what's going on. And it makes you start to think about there's things going on that we have really only in the last 20 years or so recognized in the mid-continent, in the Mississippi drainage. And makes, as a researcher, I'm like, well, Fig Island, which I'll talk about in a minute, is a shell ring. And we, uh, the top of Fig, uh, Fig 1 is above the handrail on the crosswalk uh, there. And that's oyster. That's what we think it is. Oyster piled up, oyster shells piled up that way. We can fit the whole courtyard twice the size uh, we think one would cover, and that's oyster shells. That's a lot of oysters. And um, after studying what's going on in the mid continent with uh, middle and late archaic, a lot of mounds being built, earth mounds, I'm like, well, wait a minute, is it big one? Uh, is it all oysters, or is there something underlying it? So it's given me some ideas that I hadn't contemplated before. So um, this picture, uh, I recommend, highly recommend this book it's by Ken Sassman, and it's kind of a layman's uh, book about really the end of the Middle Archaic and into the Late Archaic. And he talks about a lot of research that Ken, Ken did, uh, who's a professor at the University of Florida now in Gainesville, on um, Late Archaic societies, these, these people that are, are harvesting shellfish resources out of our rivers, riverine systems, piling uh, those shellfish resources up in, in mounds and rings in, in their life ways and what he learned over the course of uh, his career when he was at SRS and working in South Carolina before he went on to Florida. Um, it's called People of Shoals, and it's a really, really interesting uh, and good read. But that's where that image comes from. It's a lady processing some sort of grain. Um, they're uh, one of the artifacts of the late archaic or soaps on disc, and that's what this artist has, has drawn uh, somebody with a whole bunch of soapstone, which comes out of Piedmont. And it's really, you cook it, it's like cast iron. It holds heat really well. And so they got it in the fire. They're taking their disc out. They're putting it into some sort of container and making that water boil in order to cook, say, hickory nuts or venison or fish or whatever. And you just keep transferring those things. We don't think they're actually cooking with their pots over the fire. So that's what I'm giving you to pick. Um, a scene 4,000 years ago 
on the Savannah River near Augusta, a place called Stalin. So to put to place the middle and late arcade in time, and these are I should uh, this is a good place to say this, but these the arcade, the paleo, the woodland, these are all names we give it to time in order for us to try to talk about. Hey, I found an archaeological site. What did you find? I found this area. Well, okay. Uh, what does it look like? Well, it's kind of triangular. Oh, okay. Well, that might be something in the woodland period. Oh, well, it has a big notch in it. Oh, well, that might be something in the earlier period. So, we, you, you know, we've gone through this scenario. You've got to describe these artifacts. And then I can start to figure out where in time and what it is that you're, you, you found. We've done that. Archaeology has done that via excavation and carbon dating of things. But we've broken the archaic up, which is about 10,000 years, into three pieces, early, middle, late. And it, and it corresponds roughly with the Holocene. The Holocene is how we see the end of the Pleistocene, the year around 10,000 years ago, see it as a warming trend. And we're still in the end of the Holocene today. I think some people are suggesting that, they're, that we're in the Anthropocene, but that's a, another whole topic. So the uh, archaic fits roughly within that warming trend that we see coming out of the Pleistocene. Pleistocene is all these megafauna running around. And about 12,800 or so years ago, we see 30 some odd genre of megafauna die off and no longer exist. The camels, the uh, mammoths, and mastodons. Saber two cats, sloths, and so on and so forth, because it, it looks like uh, climate is getting warmer. And that's where that data, those ideas are coming from the peak core that I mentioned a little bit ago. This is coming from dozens, and if not hundreds, of peak core samples that have been taken across the southeast, eastern part of the US, even ice cores. You can get this information out of ice cores, and um, I've never read anything on ice cores other than I know you. People use those to look at past climate. And, and we do know there, you say it, the Pleistocene was colder and drier. Generally speaking, speaking the Holocene is uh, warmer and wetter, but it, it waxes and it wanes. So that's why that's occurring. Right, does that make sense? Um, I mentioned a second ago, you found that you got an area here. How old is it? Until we had carbon dating 70 years ago, I don't know. Um, I couldn't put a, a, a number on that, an age on it. Uh, Joffrey Coe, an archaeologist, famous archaeologist out of North Carolina, worked on numerous sites out of North Carolina. Hardaway site in one, Dor Dorsch. Dor I'm terrible with pronunciation, but that's another. And in the 40s, they went and they did a series of excavations, a lot like we did at Cole, on these deeply stratified sites. And strat, strat, stratigraphy is layers. So in these sites, in the wrong river, in the river, river in the system, um, they discovered that they had artifacts buried in layers. So the idea is that the ones that are up here are younger than the ones that are down here. So Code was able to develop a sequence based off of this work. But all he could say was this fluted paleo uh, closed point it came from here, and this triangular woman point came from up here. How much time is in between those two? We don't know. Didn't know. With the advent of carbon dating and a whole lot of other uh, scientific um, methods. We can start to answer those questions. Now, this is Joffrey's uh, point typology here on the, on the left. Um, he, does, he has some ideas about type, but they're not really tight. Uh, my colleague, who I mentioned earlier, who was on the boat holding the, the aluminum pipe we were fixing to put in the white pond, it took um, archaeologist named Tommy Charles, who spent 40 years across South Carolina going to collectors, collectors, farmers, and looking at their uh, um, artifact collections and quantifying on pen and paper what they had. Chris came along about a decade ago. He took Tommy's with Tommy took Tommy's data 
and uh, I'll show you a couple slides of what he developed from it. It's really, he came out with, we know a lot more about um, where people were in the past uh, because of uh, Tommy and Chris's work. Um, and we gave him able to, uh, because a lot of Chris's work had a lot more detail. I can tell you that your Savannah River stone tool dates to 48 to 4,500 years ago because of um, some of the new technology that we're able to take advantage of. And this is a profile from cold site. So we, when we dug, dig our uh, excavations, we like to have straight walls, keep the sample the same all the way down, uh, makes us look like the scientists and we know what we're doing. If you've got a sloppy wall, it looks like you're a pot or something. Uh, but Chris comes, when we're done, he'll cut a trench out, a little, little trench outside of that profile. Uh, and every two centimeters, he's taking soil samples all the way down. And he'll take each of those samples and run them to a seed and look at the same sand grains. How big are they? They're big, they're big, tiny. And that is because we want to know why are there 12,000 year old artifacts buried four foot deep in the ground? At this particular site. And, that, and Cold in particular was on the Great Beauty River. And what those tiny little samples show us is microscopic flood events, thousands of them. And so what you see is when the river's full of energy, comes out of its banks, all the material that's in that water is stirred up. And as it gets further away from the, the river, that heavy stuff drops first. Heavy, big sand grains. Now, when I say big, I'm talking into my pencil big, okay? When I say tiny, I'm talking even really tiny, okay? Uh, so we see thousands and thousands of tiny up sequence. Coarse sand to fine, coarse fine, coarse fine. That's how things get buried that deep in the ground over thousands of years. We also, each one of these, I brought a tool. At a point. Each one of these uh, little circles right there is a one inch diameter copper pipe that Chris has pushed into the wall of the unit. And he'll pull it out, put the duct tape on the back side, and he'll send that to a lab. And for a thousand dollars, they'll tell you how old those sand grains are. When the last time those sand grains saw the light? The sun activates um, this letter. Anyway, the last time that sand grain uh, was exposed to sun, ultraviolet light, there's a clock in that sun grain that gets activated. I can't I'll think of it in a minute. But he'll return and gives us the date. This is 12.3. Uh, that's 12,000 years down here. 10.6, that's 10,000 years. It won't work. I tried it. Uh, 9,000. The other thing that's showing us is that we have, I have been on the site of Chris where this was 10 and this is 12. That's a problem, okay? That helps us as archaeologists say, well, another thing as archaeologists do is determine significance. Is this site significant? Should we excavate the site before they put the highway there? You got it work? Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, one of the ways... One of the questions we ask, what can that site tell us about the past? If it's all jumbled up, if the younger dates are below the older dates, well, something's wrong. Should we spend $100,000 working on this archaeological site? If something's wrong with it, if we think the data that we get out of it will be suspect, so that's one another thing we think about. But it also helps us date stone tools. So this is a drawing of this profile. And there's a couple of pictures of stone tools and where they came from in that profile. And 10, 20, down here to 100, that's 100 centimeters, 110, 120, so that's about three feet, 3.28 feet. So with these OSL dates, optical stimulated, uh, optical luminescence dates, it helps us place these things in time. We're not actually dating the artifact, we're dating the dirt around the artifact. And we can also pull carbon out of here too and send that out for C14 data. Um, 
This is another example, same thing. Another, and this is another, uh, another profile from coal. So again, five OSL dates, uh, 17,000 at the bottom there. So this Palmer Hornemont is up here in the 9.6 to 15,000 year range, which is about a little older. We have, typically we think Palmer's in the earlier case, okay, older than, uh, or, or that's where we believe in to be. But I mentioned uh, Chris's work in conjunction with Tommy Charles, and this is a table, and you're not supposed to read it, but I threw it in here because this is Paleo Indian Stone Tools, and after 40 years of Tommy traversing the state as an employee of the University of South Carolina, collecting all that data I mentioned, and Tommy gone now, did get the order over Palmetto actually before, before he passed, which is pretty cool. Um, there's 351 uh, Paleo Indian Stone Tools in his database, 11,000 and change uh, earlier archaic, 30,000, 30,000 middle archaic. Middle, we go from 11,000 uh, stone tools in that collection. Now you have to think, these are farmers, kids picking up stuff. It's some sample, probably some accurate um, sample of what's actually out there. We know there's a lot more stone tools out there than that. But, you, but in the, we go from a, a 11,000 to 30,000. What's happening to cause, uh, what happens between the middle, I mean the early and the middle, to make it 30, you know, to, to have people have left behind it that many strong tools? And then what happens in the later case? Okay, because it drops to 18,000. That's a pretty good, pretty good drop, too. And then back in the, and then into the woodland. Right, this is 29,000. So, it starts to make you think and you want to ask questions, explain all this. Well, Chris took that data and it's by county, and so he's able to put it in GIS. And the GIS is just a fancy mapping software. And it puts, just like a topographic map, we can, we can draw a topo, and put a number in that system, and it draws contours. This is the heat map. So this is early archaic, and the green represents eight to 10 stone tools. The, the white represents 22 to 23. So in the early archaic, 10,000 years ago, we had a humongous concentration of stone tools up in this part of the state. Pretty good concentration over here uh, near SRS. But you're not so many down here in that part of the state, not so many in the other state. This is middle arcade, that 30,000 number I mentioned. Again, uh, let's see, white is representing 54 to 59. Uh, green is 12 to 18 in the, along the savannah. Not so many. People don't are, people are, seem to be hanging out along the lower part of savannah as they are up near uh, um, York County and, and over towards Charleston. Uh, not so much Charleston. And Miller Cape people kind of like Charleston. Not as much as they like Charlotte, Rock Hill. And then late Arcade. Well, late Arcade people didn't like Ford County at all. <laughs> so four to nine stone pools in, in per county in the green, where it's 25 to 28 uh, is the white. And then, you know, the numbers in between are some number of that. So late archaic, the longest amount of late archaic stone tools coming from uh, Chester, Union, Lawrence County, um, which is interesting, really interesting, because a lot we've got, I'm going to get to a little bit, shell rings along our coast that are all late archaic. We've got uh, up here near Augusta, uh, Spanish, um, excuse me, not Spanish now, uh, Stalling Island. There's several, there's several other. Uh, Later, cake size all along the Savannah River, um, but the higher number of uh, later cake stone pools is coming out of that part. Of the state. Chris has got like 100 of these maps in, in the our uh, stone tool projector point guide for the state. It's an awesome volume and tells us a humongous amount of stuff. Yes, ma'am. I don't, I don't know. I never talked with Tommy about this, but I bet I get with Chris, and, and, I, and he might have an answer for that. Um, 
Maybe it'll make security stress or not, but we'll have to have an answer for that meeting. Uh, for that question. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. There's pictures of those coming next. Um, Oh. Several things. All right. Um, 20 years ago, archaeologists thought Clovis was the Earth Clovis, uh, was the earliest um, people in the Americas, and they have a very distinctive looking stone pool. Ben's uh, dad has one in the collection upstairs. The stone pool has been donated. There's a included one. And archaeologists 20, as recent as 20 years ago, we did, and if they got that Clovis layers, uh, they stopped. They said, there's nothing below that. But then there's other archaeologists in the country that have, for whatever reasons, went deeper, but there's stuff below that. And now we're beginning to recognize there is something. There's st there are stone tools below the Clovis level. So, Today, we would not, if I was at doing an excavation, I wouldn't stop if I got to Clovis. I'd keep going until just you got nothing. And, and a cold site at about um, 150, things ran out. Just no artifacts, period. But that, no, 100, I'm sorry, 150 centimeters. So a meter and a half, uh, four and a half, five feet. But that's landform that cold is on is two and a half, three meters in depth of sand. So, yeah, to the bottom of the causal of sand. So um, we would we auger down to figure out where we get into kind of uh, bedrock type stuff. Um, in the Piedmont, more than, most of the time, you're only going to dig about this deep anyway, because uh, you're going to get rid of clay subsoil. Um, cotton farming throughout the, the end of the 18th, early 19th century, wiped out all of the soils in the Piedmont. So you know, the Broad River in Columbia is uh, lastly was really orange. It's not as orange today. You know, I can imagine that the Great Piedmont is pretty orange. We got rains coming out of the upstate. You know, all that is flushing all that material. So all of our floodplains today, there's at least that much historic illusion on them. Ben wants us to go help find the snow uh as Mary can find snow island. Well I got a feeling it's at least that deep. And that's in the 18th century. Um, but we don't find out. So there are a lot of different answers to that question. It depends on where you are, it depends on the geology, it depends on the um, anthropogenic stuff that's happening in the place. You know, you know, a lot. A lot of answers. And that, one of the things I'm interested in is replicating things. That's a Mara Mountain, and I was just messing around, and I glued it to the end of that. River came. So that's a middle archaic stone tool. Um, and I could cut that piece of paint off and use that as a knife. Or I could put it on a really long uh, dart arrow and it would be a projectile. So things are knives and they're projectiles. I like to think of them more times than not as knives. Stone, you think about stone as being expensive. Because we can't walk out there and get a rock and make an arrowhead. I don't have to go to the river. That's going to take a bit to get there. Because um, there's rocks in the river I know I can access. And uh, that's going to take some energy to go and come. So why would I make a stone tool and throw it at that deer and have that deer run off because I hit him in the wrong place and lose my stone tool that I spent a long time going to get? So I can make a piece of wood be sharp and pointy just as lethal as a stone tool or a projectile. So. All right. Here's the stone tool. Uh, so, took Chris as a, a stone tool guy and or his sequence, excuse me, Chris actually uh, colored in the middle of our cave here. These are, and I'm not going to show you a lot of pictures of stone tools. So these are things that we see consistently coming out of the early archaic and 
into the middle of okay? So this little Stanley is represented right there by a little picture of one. Y'all can pass that around. Um, but these are, so when you, you know, when I meant said something earlier, you know, oh, I found an arrowhead on the side. Everybody's going to call that an arrowhead. That's fine. It's not really an arrowhead, but it's a knife. But I need to know what it looks like in order to be able to place it in that sequence. So these are these are more mountains um, named for site North Carolina, which is what the, the base of that looks like inside that hat. Uh, it's a little, little narrow stem thing that's sitting in that socket. They're a little bit more recent in time than that the one I showed earlier. And then here's something coming forward in time even more. Uh, we call these Gilberts. Um, so instead of a more pointy base, they have a more flattened base. So earlier fake stuff has got notches. People will put notches in the base, and that's to tie it to something. Whatever it is that causes people to want to change that uh, hacking technique to make it more of a stem, a square stem, or a contracting stem. We see that happen. We, I don't, we don't know why. I mean, nobody has a really good answer as to why. But that technology, that you know, changes. Uh, it, it's kind of like you know, we were driving 50, you know, Model A's and then 55 Chevys, and now we're driving. Well, then we were driving Hugo's, and now we're driving. Uh, what are the electric cars called? <laughs> so maybe that's the explanation. Who you knows? Um, so, another thing we, we think about is where are people on the landscape? Early archaic people, really everywhere. Every, with all of the river drainages, with all over the uplands. Middle archaic people, not so much. They move out of those river valleys. They're, they are occupying the river valleys, but not to the degree that early archaic people were. They're more in the uplands. Sand hills, uh, we find more of their stuff up there. Um, one of the things we start, and, and that has to, we think has to do with climate, how hot, and dry, and wet. You know, if it's a really wet climate, you have your rivers constantly flooding, and you don't really know. Probably not a good idea to be in the river valley if it rains in North Carolina and you're in like cold. Overnight, you might be, you might be, your bedding might be wet more when you wake up. So we think people are trying to stay out of the river valley because of that. But towards in, in, in throughout most of the Middle Archaic, which lasts a good um, two, three thousand years, really the only artifacts they got are those stone tools that I showed you earlier. Towards the end, we start to see a whole lot more stuff, and we don't know exactly why. We think there is a bit of a population increase. Um, and for a minute, uh, when I start to talk about stuff in the West, some of this might make sense. But we start to see these things, and these things are called uh, banner stones. And they're rocks that can be rather small. Some of them are really big, almost too big, too big to be useful for anything other than showing off. Uh, they have a hole drilled out, and they're for this tool, and that's the one that I've replicated. So the rock back here on the back end of this wooden stick, which has an antler handle, an antler hook, and we know that configuration from a site in Kentucky called Indian Knoll, where there are burials where individuals have the antler hook, the stone weight, and the antler handle laying what appears to be laying across as if that thing was put in the ground with it. The wood of it, of course, is gone. The so shell and the soil um, start, uh, is allowed for the preservation of the antler. That's another thing we start to see towards the end of the middle arcade. Uh, while people are harvesting anything that moves and flies and crawls, they start to harvest shellfish, especially in Tennessee in the river 8,000 years ago. They're harvesting tons of shellfish, freshwater mussels, bringing that stuff up on the land. Form. We saw it in coal, uh, not quite that old. And they're processing those shellfish, eating that stuff. That shell gets its way in the soil and it changes soil chemistry and allows for preservation of things you wouldn't normally get. 
So, um, which was the, the amber. In South Carolina, we have amber. We've never brought amber hooks, stone weights. I haven't seen any amber handles um, yet. But we also have, and I'm going to talk about uh, hockey uh, shell ring in a minute, we have amber projectile. So that's a piece of deer amber, been drilled. It's about uh, four or five inches long. And it would have been put on the end of a dart, a piece of cane, twice, three times that long. And used with this tool, it's kind of like in, you know, in the cafeteria, you take your straw and you put your finger on the back end of the straw and you push it, as opposed to holding it in the middle like you do a dart. You push it to the back end, it's going to go a lot farther. And that's what the diagram down here is showing. Now, we think people had addle addles, is what we call these things, but, uh, prior to um, all throughout the early archaic and into the middle archaic, but we don't. This is what we think they look like in the middle arcade. Into the middle arcade. The other thing they've got, ground stall. Now, these are from Stallings Island, or dug up by a guy named Clapham in the 1940s and 50s, or maybe no, even the early 30s, 1930s. Stallings on in the open air Augusta. Now, the big guy here is probably eight inches long. Um, probably weighs five pounds. They're all made out of dye based dye. They're really heavy, very hard. These things are not easy to make. Um, this is a real nice example from somewhere. But you, these are axes, and they're big axes. They have little guys. There's a couple upstairs in the display that are little ones, but they have big ones too. Now, you know, I've got a lot of uh, woodworking tools in my garage. You know, if I'm going to take down the big tree, I'm not using the little carpenter's axe. So, what are they doing with these big axes? We do not find evidence of structure from middle or thicker. There's some hints, but but not nothing obvious. Um, this is watercolor. Uh, John White did of uh, Indian Town um, in North Carolina, I believe. P-O-N-E-I-O-O-C. Um, but you see the palisade around it. John White was an early uh, explorer. I jumped forward about 10,000 years. Uh, he came into um, the southeast when we were still a colony and started doing a lot of watercolor and other drawings of native people. Um, we don't have any idea of what middle archaic people's village sites look like. Uh, I'm big big. Uh, this is a historic Indian village, but I use it to illustrate what that thing is for since I can't bring an axe in here and chop on a tree. So even those things continue to be used into historic time where axes are like them. But if you're going to build this thing, you're going to cut all those trees, you've got to have an axe. So what does that mean about middle arcade and late arcade? What are they doing? What kind of construction are they doing? Are they have those big axes? And why can't we find big villages sites with big old palisades? We did not find, I've been thinking back to the coal, we did not find any grooved or ground stone tools like that at coal. Now, if you're going to be building boats, that's what I'd start with, and coal's on the river, so, but we didn't get in after 20 years of digging, and, and I don't even remember, you know, 200, two meters squares, nothing like that. So, that's another conundrum. Uh, I put this in here because that's another axe in the ads. Um, at Pocky, uh, our shell ring site, we've got hundreds of these things. And they range from little guys to big guys. They punch a hole in it, right there, and they modify the end. And this one is really ground, nice and smooth. And they put a handle on it. This is one I made. And you can, you can throw big chips on it. You can take it, take it to the tree and then pull it off. What are you doing with that? Throwing chips when you're cutting that tree down, they work and they work really well. So, um, in Pocky, that's another thing. Uh, but I uh, don't always see those on uh, these sites, but uh, at least not in the interior, they're really coastal things. Um, what do these people eat? Everything. If it moves, flies, frogs, the, the really don't have a whole lot of middle arcade. Uh, 
fall and more remains. <clears throat> they aren't agriculturalists, they aren't domesticating things yet. We suspect they might be beginning to. Um, but we just don't see that sort of any, any evidence for that kind of stuff. Um, evidence of conflict. Uh, those are uh, hairy fractures. If somebody's coming at you, put your arms up. Uh, burials that are preserved, a good number of them, seemingly more than more than average, have some sort of violent trauma on them. Projectile points in bones, vertebras, pelvises. You're, the, the, <coughs> more interesting read Indian Knoll, uh, Webb is the author. Indian Knoll is in Kentucky. They actually had a lot of burials in the um, 30s. Those people were in pretty rough shape. What happened caused? There were arms missing, legs missing, heads missing, torsos cut in half. There was some amount of violence going on. We don't think of these people as really big organized uh, tribes, you know, band level, or, or egalitarian. They're not not warfare. We don't think it's warfare, but there's something, some sort of violence occurring. Um, this is getting into late archaic. This is a piece of copper that, that was uh, recovered about three years ago from a shell ring on the Georgia coast. Uh, colleague Matt Sanger is at Smithsonian now working on um, our next month. Sea pine, I don't remember the sea pine or another shell, other shell ring, but anyway, it's a piece of copper that was in a cremation burial on this lay archaic site, um, they tested the copper, it comes out of the Great Lakes. So it was a, a, a thing of a, a wristband type thing. But coast of Georgia is a long way from the Great Lakes. If we see that beginning in the middle archaic, long distance trade of exotic materials are moving across the southeast. Um, Combarred a lot of these sites with some colleagues, and they had this one in there. The little Holocene in Eastern North America. We see the emergence of complex cultural systems clearly indicating some areas. It's not ubiquitous across the Southeast, and what he's talking about is places like this in Louisiana. This is called Watson Break. Uh, it's 5,600 years old. It's over here in the southern part, the middle southern part of Louisiana. It's an earth, earth mound. It's about 280 meters across, and the highest pile of dirt is uh, four meters high. So not quite that high, but 280 meters bigger than a football field. Like I said these people were band level, egalitarian, not farmers. There's a lot of labor went into moving a lot of dirt 5,000 years ago. How are they feeding themselves? Uh, why are they doing it? What kind of control, political, social control is going on that allows for? The organization to do that. Now, do we have that South Carolina? Not that I know. But this is making me think about what's underneath Big One, which I was what I was talking about very early. Why is Big One that shell mound dates the late archaic it's so huge? What's buried on it? Is there a middle archaic uh, component to it? Who do you want to dig with? And we've been, we've got to go to poverty. We stood up, we went to the last sea in Mississippi, we stood up on top of Mount, uh, Mount A. Uh, you get to go to Louisiana, go to Pottery Park. It is cool. This is another very beginning of the late arcade. Again, um, not agriculturalists, man level. Uh, from here to here is, uh, shoot, I, I want to say it's a two kilometer. Which is huge. There's six. There's six of these ridges. There's this this mound. Uh, latest research suggests that nine thousand people showed up and worked on that for three months and built that. Thing. And it was twenty thousand dump truck loads of dirt would take to do that today. Who's feeding those people? And they, the soil scientists look at that because when, 
You know, when the paint on the car oxidizes, so if you take dirt, put disturbed dirt, it oxidizes. And all the layers in that mound, none were oxidized, suggesting very quick piling up. And that thing would consume this building. Um, what is it that brings all these people to the middle of Louisiana? And so up here, 4,000 years ago, uh, to build this thing, um, what are they doing there? Uh, and nobody had uh, recent David Anderson has suggested uh, it's a pilgrimage site. Yeah. Kind of, but it's huge. I mean, you could. Yeah, they're ridges. Um, they been it was just it was farmed in historic time. So some are more plowed now, but they were probably you know, a meter, two meters in height, and uh, three to four or five meters in width. Uh, so yeah, near the bend, or, and uh, you know, city blocks in length. In the well, I'm sorry. This is the artist's rendition of what people, what would it look like uh, when it's built and occupied. Um, and he does uh, suggest that people are living on those ridges. Um, this is a, uh, now is an octopus part of the river. Um, some excavations have identified wood hinges. You know, with, uh, stone hinge. We're now in Europe and in Great Britain. They found other wood hinges. That is posts dug holes dug to set post and you know, the post are gone. But there's some evidence of very large trees being set in the ground uh, to form hinges of some sort. Uh, there are other mounds out there. Um, there are exotics, the exotic materials that come in to here, uh, to this site, from the, the greater, uh, let's see, I follow the point of the greater Mississippi Valley, which we compass all the wall up there and have that map and think about the Mississippi River. Hundreds of miles away, they're bringing raw, uh, flint and other exotic rocks to the site. People are coming from, should have, I left, took the slide out, but now we have left in there. And hundreds of miles away, bringing all kinds of exotics, um, and some of which is soapstone. There's no soapstone in Louisiana. There's no soapstone in Florida. Soapstone is a metamorphic rock that occurs on the east side of the Appalachian Mountains all the way from southern Alabama into uh, Panama. Washington, D.C., the big soapstone quarry, Atlanta, Georgia, the big one. Uh, Packlet Mills in South Carolina, uh, Spartanburg, Greenwood County, uh, Soapstone Church up on Pickens, in Pickens County along the Highway 11. All these places, there's, there's this rock that's real, you scratch and feel like soap. Well, I mentioned it earlier, it's like cast iron. You can make, um, historically, we make bed warmers out of it. Little flat pieces of soapstone, put it in front of the fire, put it in the bed, keep your toes warm. Uh, Countertops, you know, things like that today, soapstone ovens. These people were making all, you know, ally out of ways. They're making bowls out of this stuff. They're making um, cooking stones, which are flat on the disc with a hole in them, that I first mentioned. Um, they're traveling, they're carrying thousands of soapstone vessels, bowls, to this place in, in uh, Poverty Point, Louisiana. Um, those are, uh, so those are a middle, a late, here's another late archaic site closer to home. This is um, Stallings, uh, yes, yeah, Stallings Island in the middle of Savannah River. And they put Stallings on the main. Uh, Anyway, Ken Sassman, did, as I mentioned earlier, did a bunch of work here about 20 years ago. It's been, archaeologists have been interested in installing for 150 years. There's, he's got several articles out there, and that book I mentioned, People of the Shoals, uh, gives a good overview of, of, of what's happened at Stalin. Stalin's is in, on the fall line. Um, it's here on I-20, heading towards Augusta. If you look upstream, uh, you won't see it, but that's where it is. It's upstream a little above it. Um, it's a shell, several acres shell, and then just shell by that's three or four meters uh, as tall as that in, in shell. There's burials, there's axes I showed in there, there's lots of 
banner stones that were um, deposited there. And we see this start to happen in the beginning and later arcade. Okay, we think the climate has chilled out, not more like today. These rivers have started to uh, normalize and stay in their channels and, and has allowed for shellfish and other things to start to grow and people are having um, a pretty dependable food source. And so they're harvesting that stuff, discarding that shell, which will allow for a great preservation of things we don't want to get, um, including all the fish and other mammals and reptiles and whatnot that they're, they're harvesting in the area. But that's closer to home. This is a map of that site and uh, showing excavation. It's not a great map. Um, these are some of the, the features we see. And on this uh, image, it's all the shell, and you can kind of see how it's built up in layers. It's all coming off the slope of the, of the big mound. Pits. Um, sorry, they're dark. Uh, but these are pits that are dug into the subsoil, so you get that orange subsoil color, and then they're backfilled with all this organic material, which leaves the soil black and, and very dark in color. We think of these pits as storage pits, trash deposit pits, um, but beyond that, we really don't know, we don't have any good ideas for what they are. Sometimes pits are barriers. These don't happen to be, but uh, these people are digging holes. We need to call them pit people more than anything. They're digging holes all over the place. Um, close to them, I mentioned a couple times, uh, I had to go get a talk to a reporter out of Charleston. And this was his title, Big Island Shell Ring, a Mystery Treasure, Treasure and Biggest Preservation Headache, Humans. That was his title. Um, as, uh, you know, in, in the Heritage Trust, managing properties, managing things, we don't like to put a lot of signs up. Signs make great target places. Parking lots are great places to get rid of stuff. Um, so humans, uh, in managing these sites that we own for citizens of this state, those are things that we have to deal with. Um, this is an aerial image of the uh, Fig Island Shell Ring Complex. There's Fig 2, that's Fig 3, the crest, that's Fig 1. And this contour, this other map right here, kind of gives you the scale. This, a football field would fit inside of Fig 2. More than one football field would fit inside of Fig 1. And the lighter color is depicting elevation. Um, I'm not going to talk, I don't think I got anything else on that, but because big is a whole other um, hour lecture in and of itself. Uh, thousands, hundreds of millions of shells, the, the later cave pottery, um, bone, antler, tools. Um, uh, it's on Bonnie Bay Air Reserve in Edisto. It's only open to uh, tour by prearranged tour. But it's a, you know, an enigma in these shell ring sites, shell bearing sites that we have on our coast of the Savannah River in the mid continent. It is humongous. How much, this is what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking, is there something middle archaic underneath this bigger, late archaic thing? Um, it's, uh, you only can go at high tide. You've only got about an hour to walk around. Um, it's 4,000 years old. And at that time, sea level was about a meter lower. So now, at high tide, you better have your rubber boots on when you get wet. So we can see how sea level has changed in those, um, over the millennia. Um, probably the main most significant development we see in the later Arcade is the development of pottery. Before the later Arcade, there's no pottery in North America. People here for six, seven, eight thousand years, no pottery. Why all of a sudden, 4,000 years ago, did they take the play and start to make pots? Um, that, uh, those shirts are actually from coal. And when I was an undergrad, I grad school, I can get with but I took those shirts and I glued them back together. And there is Nick Parker, you all see him from Columbia, uh, in our office. And I glued them together and I got the curve, you know, the, cur the horizontal curve, and then also the vertical curve. And then in the computer, in AutoCAD, you can draw it. So the black silhouette represents those curves. The 
distance between them is the diameter, and we, with the computer, you come up with the volume. So three and a half gallons is what I suggest that. Tom's Creek, which is the name we've given that pottery, Blade Arcade, um, <coughs> size of that vessel. Um, our work at Pocky is, is uh, and one of our staff has taken that use for her senior thesis, and she did that. I'll show you a picture in a minute um, of what she did in that day, and, and what she was able to say about uh, their pottery tool kit. You know, you go in your kitchen, you got little bowls, big bowls. So I'll show you a minute what she came up with. Um, so when you have a few stone tools from the late arcade, these, I said they were, we, you know, earlier arcade, we went from notch to, to stem or contracting stem. What I mean by stem is it's kind of squared off a little base like that. Um, these are, again, just continuing in that ever uh, changing stone tool technology. Why did they make the change? We don't know. Uh, these are a little lighter. These are classic Savannah River. Uh, their stems are a little bigger, a little different shape. Um, that was all the area that I brought to show. Soapstone bowls. Everybody thinks I mentioned soapstone bowls going to Louisiana, Poverty Point. Well, here's here's the, the where I got that information from. Uh, Ken Sassman again, uh, taking soot, soot samples off of these bowls, carbon dating those samples. And quantifying shows that soapstone bowls, which you would kind of think predate pottery, ceramic clay, don't. Here's uh, pottery. You don't really have any, there is no soapstone bowl dates. All those things, the majority of those dates are post development of pottery. Why? Sassman suggests these things are. Probably have a different function than, than clay pottery. And, you know, these guys living in the Piedmont where they can get access to that stuff, and they see, hey, those guys down on the coast are making that stuff out of this, making these things out of clay. We don't have any clay up here. They, they had to figure it out, maybe, and they did, in fact. But let's make them out of the stone, maybe, and we can trade them to those people down there. But we want some of those ones they made out of clay. It's probably more complicated. Um, any good archaeologist knows where to find the Warren Mountain Point in South Carolina. Uh, this is up in Fairfield County. I just been thinking about this whole talk. I was riding around looking for sites. And on this particular site, as a panoramic view, uh, went there five minutes, picked up a Warren Mountain, picked up an early arcade, picked up a Guilford, which is a, a, a middle, end of the middle arcade. So we have an early, um, middle to middle, and then into the middle arcade, sitting on this eroded hilltop. Um, there is an urban hilltop in South Carolina that doesn't have at least one of those stone tools, in particular the Mar Mountains. Mar Mountains are known to be on the top of hills. Why are they hanging out on these topographic points? Um, are they looking for something to eat? Are they looking for somebody to acquire? Are they looking out for those people who might be trying to acquire them to carry all soaps on balls to poverty point. <laughs> Alright. Um, that's the end of the middle and late arcade. Is there does that kind of give a somewhat of a picture? Right. I'm gonna run through these um, pretty quick. This is uh, about our work later kick shell ring that we discovered about five years ago on Botany Bay Harris Preserve in uh, Esto Island. Didn't know it was there. That's an aerial shot of Pocky Island. You've been to Botany, you walk out the causeway to go to the beach, that's where you go. Um, there's a couple pictures. Here's another aerial view of Fig. That's Fig 2, Fig 3, Fig 1, and Pocky is way over there, about two miles away. Where my point of view. Um, it's in you know, less than two miles from, from the, the, the uh, shell ring we discovered on the top. Here's an aerial above, straight above Fig 2. It's not a circle, it's not a green, it's a hexagon. So um, even the piling of their refuse is plain, it's, it's six sided. 
if I had a topo map, you could really see it. Uh, the vegetation kind of hides it. Uh, but it, it's a it's a hexagon. Why do you throw your trash away in, like that? Uh, celeries, there's about 25 to 28 that we know of. They're, I, we're pretty sure there's more along our coast from Charleston down into Georgia. Other shell dairy sites on, uh, up the Savannah River. That's what all these dots are. Um, possibly is, uh, right there. Oh, there it is. Okay. Thank you, Meg. Uh, one of the folks not did this slide, I didn't realize it was the start of the complex, so that, that's, that's uh, the top. Um, there are middle arcade shell maps, um, more so in Florida, uh, Gold Coast. Uh, this is Mike Russo, uh, his work looking at shell range and shell mounds. Um, and these silhouettes are all to scale, so in Florida they're much, much, much bigger. You see, here's Fig 2. I mentioned the hexagon. There's Fig 1. And then these are the other, other shell rings we have in South Carolina. And so you see, Fig, fig 1 is the biggest. Uh, but in Florida, Fig 1 would be the smallest. Um, here's some from Georgia. Now, there's more than that, but that gives you a, an idea of their size and shape. Now, light R, light R is. Uh, We've flown the whole state and use that data to help us make plans for things. LIDAR, you get an airplane with a laser beam in it, shooting lasers at the ground, return, the, the computer collects it, knows how far away from home, and you can create a very detailed topographic map. That's how we that's how we identified the two rings. Here's ring one. See that higher red color there? This is a shell uh, overburden from the ocean throwing shell up. Now, this is the beach. Uh, this was flown in 2015, uh, I think. And then ring two, back here. Now, all these linear things you see are agricultural ditches from the uh, cotton farm in the uh, end of the 18th, early 19th century. Uh, this all produced, you know, Edison's famous long ring, a long stage of cotton. Um, and we think that led to these things being plowed out a bit because if you walk out to the maritime forest, you can't see them at all. We started working on this because of this. This is a king tide. It's, it's taking the island. Um, you can see we, we went back to look at imagery. Here's 1949. There's the uh, showing cotton 73. Here I was born. There's cotton 2013. There it is now. Now the uh, ocean is behind that system. Uh, I showed you these well pools earlier. Tons of fall remains. It, 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 any kind of critter, uh, fish, man, any vertebrate, fish up here, uh, birds, you name it, they're harvesting and uh, seeing in vast, vast water. Shellfish, whelks in the thousands, uh, uh, arcs and uh, periwinkles, uh, humongous, humongous. I mentioned earlier the pottery, a uh, colleague at work, uh, uh, Katie uh, Garcia, or Kate Garcia took, and from these shirts came up the models of sizes. So she's got this small little hole, little individual cup down to this large, as much as eight gallons. So they're, they're what do you do with eight gallon pot? We do with a five gallon pot. We cook them for a lot of heat, we cook them a lot of salt. Why? We're doing that we're out of the park. We got something big to do. You know, we're processing a pig. Um, shell beans. They're taking a lot of those shells, the wealth, the clams, and whatnot, and we're getting a lot of a lot of bean blanks. They're not drilled yet. Lots of them. There's hundreds of these things. And, and then lots of all. So they're all they're manufacturing, but they're, they're, they're leaving some behind. So are they wearing those on the clothes? Just like on the store sites, we find buttons all over the place because the button gets snatched off. Bone tools. You got you have to see the bone pins in person to appreciate them. 
the lines that are carved in here, these, those lines uh, in that pen go wrap around one side of the other and they come together. Each meet in the next one. And they are um, um, This one has four segments of cross hatch. And that cross hatching, I think it wraps all the way around. And I say this, exactly accurate. They do not color outside the line. They do not get outside of that boundary line with their, I mean, it, it's not the people that have to have these that are doing that. Somebody with good eyes has, uh, is doing that and it is so fine. Um, it's really it's a lot of fun. You've got several microscopes with Parker. It's a lot of fun that, and I, I really don't like looking through microscopes, but actually I will sit down and look through microscopes to see to look at that execution. We tried to replicate it, and I don't, I can't replicate it. Um, some of them aren't decorated. Uh, probably a year bone carved to a point. Uh, I think a lot of these things are complete. Wow. Most of them work are broken. Uh, Christine Weber did her uh, senior thesis on them, and she's, and she's still qualified. We're still going through We've got 130 square meters of uh, excavation that we did. Um, so we're still going through all that uh, material, still finding more pins, and we're north of 100 pins um, on the end so far. So 130 square meters in the site itself within 3,600 square meters. To multiply that up, how many bone pins could, could have been on that site? Uh, we, we dug uh, was, 130 percent of 3600. I should have done that back earlier. We've done a small percentage. The um, this one is complete. I think he's got the point of it got cut off in the picture. Um, but yes, yeah, that one is complete. Most of those are. Um, some of the lines are are, uh, are not so geometric. They're Really abstract and, and really great work of art. And this is a marshman job. And trying to figure out when it, when it came up, Karen Smith of the Art College brought me so excited about it. So we've got an old drill in the job, man on the farm. What is it? Didn't know what it was a marshman. It was a little bit of a rat there, a little bit of a possum, because it's, it's only about this big. Finally, uh, I remember an article, DNR Wildlife Magazine had tweeted up. Uh, Staff and um, uh, uh, return marsh meat to the marsh. And well, sure enough, you the marsh meat, and there it was. It was a set of earrings on email. What I found on the internet, which is, it looked just like this. This is 4,000 years old. So I, I'm guessing some late archaic person had a marsh meat earring. Um, this is where the site is on the beach. What it's looking like. What it looks like now. Uh, these are features. That's a big pit. It's all the dirt that was created that pit or surrounded that pit is washed away. And it was back, uh, back filled with shell and other organic material. This is what the forest looks like in the interior. How we had to cut line through it to be able to set up our total station and start doing our map. And then here's that minor image. And we had Mike Russo and National Park Service and his staff come up out of Tallahassee and they drove rods, probes into the ground across uh, Ring One to develop this heat map. What's called the darker the red, the uh, thicker the shell. And so the yellow is not very much shell, the blue is no shell. But this is a map of that three dimensional map of Ring One. So on the LIDAR imagery on the ground surface, it looks nice and circular ground. But when you understand what is beneath it, you see it's not so uniform. What's causing that is this differential depositions of, sh of shale, uh, which this is probably nice and circular because it's been plowed over. And uh, the plow helps distribute things evenly. Whereas this is suggesting there's some. Why is there no shell? Why is there a spot here in the middle of shell all around? Is that somebody's living space? The 
plot on it here in the middle, but the plot has to show them. So we decided to do, this is three seasons, four seasons worth of excavation. We cut a trench across the, this um, western side of the ring. We cut a trench into this side of the, of the ring itself, and we worked a bunch in the plaza to expose that. And what artifacts are in the plaza? Are they different than they are in, in the ring itself? So this is that trench coming across on the west side. There's a pit that's connected to that was the pit before we took all the dirt out. This, they must have roasted a whole deer in here. And there was uh, two or three dozen bone hens in that area. Um, this area actually took the highest concentration of bone hens on in any of our excavations thus far. Um, but it was a practically it looked like a whole deer in, in that pit. Um, it's a terrible place to have to work. Tarik is a draw Tarik is one of our archaeologists. Tarik is probably been a great man for a long time. He's, he's mapping in features. But I get phone. I loved, I loved it when I would get a phone call. You could hear the waves crashing. What are you doing? That work. <laughs> really an expletive said to me afterwards. Um, this is me here doing more excavation of this feature right here. And sorry it's so dark, but turns out. This is not late archaic. That's a, a, a big, a big pit. This big around, about that big, slap full of oysters. And after a while, we began to realize there's a pit. There's a pit. There's a pit. That pit has late archaic artifacts in it. And the oysters look like that. That pit doesn't have late archaic artifacts in it. The oysters look different. This is. Thousand or two thousand years younger than the late Arctic. This is a woodland pit. We began to realize woodland people coming in, reoccupying the site. No doubt they can see that mound of shell before historic times when he got plowed down. They're reoccupying the site. They're doing the same thing. They're harvesting moisture, processing them, whatnot. Their pottery, which looks a lot different than the Tom's uh, later pig pottery, is going into their trash pits. But you can see it in the oysters. The oyster looks slightly different. Karen's done a photo research paper on human impacts the last 4,000 years with colleagues in Georgia on, on how humans are harvesting, how they're harvesting um, shellfish is affecting oyster populations 4,000 years ago. It's a little bit like what happened in the 19th century when we went in and all the oyster factories wiped out the oyster beds. You can see it in the oysters, they get smaller over time. Later, okay, people were able to do that. I forgot to mention that about Stalin's Island. So Ken Zaskin says the fish bones that are at the bottom, which would be the oldest, the big fish up at the top, and they were there for about 500 years, the little fish. They over, over exploited their environment. Snails. He was looking for pollen. He couldn't find pollen in those sediments. But he had snails. Well, snails, different species of snails live in different environments. Snails at the bottom are in a woodland environment. Snails at the top are more grass and more in So what does that say about what those people over the course of 500 years did to get stone on top? They went from eating big fish to little fish. And they had snails living in a woodland setting. And they had snails living in a grassland setting. They changed the environment 4,000 years ago. Animals. There's the uh, plaza. Now this is, I think, animated. So that's when we excavated into the middle of the shell-free plaza in all of the staining that we saw. These are pits on top of pits on top of pits. And they're incredibly complicated and pit. So, another thing we've been doing is photogrammetry so in the way to document our excavations. We take a lot of pictures, dump them in the computer, software will stitch them all together. It's been, it's, it's been a humongous, uh, humongous step forward. One, we can show it. And I, we can go do this one afternoon and take pictures overnight, run through the computer, and then go back in the field the next day, and, and we'll have to draw one. Whereas, like I said, we earlier, 
when the piece of paper, you know, hand drawn things, and we still do that. But this gives us a really accurate map. We can put it in AutoCAD, we can trace on it, we can write on it, say this is what we did. It's awesome. Um, then we cut a trench across. We didn't have time to excavate the whole thing, but we knew there was pits we wanted to know more about them. So Chris is there, then taking some samples, uh, soil samples for analysis, but also wanted to get a profile of that pit. You notice that white band over here, this dark stuff in the middle? We're trying to figure out what's going on. So these soils, that white stuff, really yellow, and this orange little clay, we know comes from really deep in the ground, five, four, four, north of four foot deep. It shouldn't be up here. So that dirt has been brought up from below. So the pit outline is not there, it's here. The original pit was there. That dirt came from much deeper in the ground. Maybe got thrown on the side, maybe got back in a little bit. And then there's a second pit right here that forms that gray boundary and with some shell in it. So they, in, in, at some point, in, in the ground is, you get in the water table and start to turn with blue. Uh, but they're digging the pit on top of the pit on top of the pit. And we, we don't, a lot of them don't have much in uh, Here's another example. Gray, initial pit, and then here's nothing but oyster shell. This could be a, one of those woodland pits that's truly into that. Uh, we had the you know, our partner at Mississippi State, a good friend and colleague, uh, uh, Shane uh, Miller, brought his students up and they did they, their work, um, created this map. So here's Green One. Oh, and by the way, here's the British shoreline map. The so Green One, you can see, is gone. All of our excavations. No, no longer exists there in Carroll Beach. There's green too. But what Shane and his students did was, was help us out with digging shovel test to uh, the small holes across the house so that we can better understand is are there activities taking place outside of the ring? And there are. Um, we subsequently went back and put excavations which was there and there and there. And um, and have collected those artifacts and we don't know exactly what it means yet. That's what the purpose of that was. Here's the carbon date. So we take the hickory nut and set it off for radio carbon 14 so we can figure out where this thing exactly fits in time. And it's right at 2300. And all those carbon dates line up very, very nicely. Um, so it really looks, and carbon, unfortunately, you get a long uh, span of, you know, it's plus or minus 50 or 100. You never know, you know, you know much more than 50 years where you are, where it is. These just fly so nice and perfectly right at that 4,300 year um, number, uh, 4,300 years ago. So does that suggest that maybe one day we'll have some sort of data taking and put it you know, on the decade? Um, does that suggest this is a very short occupation? Was it a month? Was it two weeks? Was it six months? Was it six years? All of our projects have some amount of public interaction, uh, except, of course, with COVID, but we'll get back to that. Mr. Scott Jones is going to talk about primitive skills and what the kind of things you think we've been doing. Uh, Bess, uh, Kelly, who works at Botany, gives a talk to uh, her, her volunteer staff, telling them about what we're doing. Always try to get kids involved, have Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts come out. Um, big part of our, our project. Lots of newspaper articles and, and newspapers um, out and, um, visiting the site, and usually about half of what they write is in breath, so it just makes you think about all the stuff you're reading in the paper. <laughs> and at Parker, we put together an exhibit, had that up for a while, and a lot of long hands and, and other things uh, we had learned down at that site. And, uh, that's why we're interested in working on late archaic. Honestly, I don't think we work on anything middle archaic. I can think of, but we do own some middle archaic sites, so maybe at some point. But that's our focus right now because it's like Ring One's gone. It was there five years ago. I'm done. Yes. 
Oh yeah, yeah, yes, that's on the board service property. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a board wall. Yeah, you can walk on that one. Steve is a tough. No C under tough. Yeah, but that's uh, John Campbell done a bunch of work on that one. A lot of other people worked on it too. Um, seaweed, yeah, Google, you can Google seaweed and, and there's some National Park Service stuff, out, I think. If not, you know, can we get my contact? DNA is, uh, DNA data is, is uh, those people have are mig are migrated out of Asia through very nice uh, land bridge. Twelve thousand years ago, World War uh, was so much lower, or they come over by boat. Um, these uh, DNA analysis says that's where these people originated in, um, in you know, Siberia, uh, that part of Asia, uh, fourteen thousand or so years ago. Uh, there's, we do know that uh, any with populations, there's been multiple migrations. Likely there's multiple migrations into the Americas, either over land or by boat. Um, but, but doing uh, destructive types of analysis on Native American remains is difficult today because of the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act. Uh, and um, in order to do that kind of thing, you have to get uh, related uh, communities, Native peoples, to buy into doing it, to give permission. So answering those questions is kind of hard. Uh, that legislation is about 20 years old. Um, some were going prior to that from some burials in Florida. Show that the burials on the St. John River in North Florida, those were um, middle or later Native people too in this particular uh, site. And they had been born in the Virginia's. Or what is now the uh, 4,000, 5,000 years ago, the senior uh, teeth, the water you drink, the minerals you ingest, uh, had a certain signature where you grow up. Uh, so that gets you know, embedded into your teeth so you can extract that and figure out, suggest where on the planet or which the continent you may have originated. Short. Um, some stuff I was reading suggests the point like expects me expect to be in the later I forget now what it is later take the market uh, if you made it made it at 20 was life expectancy based on looking at the burial in the cemeteries and um, if you made it 15 they said you, you could probably expect to get 35 very few people made it but they were helpful. Just you're you're in the native natural world. Whatever you're, everything you're consuming, you're gathering and making and building. So that's going to be that's that's a lot of body. Um, they they uh, uh, no, what? But what? But it's better it's better off to gather in your natural world. You want to start in home on the sugars to start with. Now, uh, we do recover teeth on uh, sites like this, and people lose teeth, and, uh, and they are worn flat. So there you can buy grip. Even uh, you know, young, uh, young people's teeth, and all of the, or what your molars and put the, the grooves in your molars. They just want to slam flat with no degrees left. Um, you know, I didn't really come across that. I don't know.
and then we do a lot of the physical anthropology stuff to answer that question. Thank you.